to talk about rare complications of Waldenstrom's, and I, I, as you can understand, there are so many. I cannot put all of them here. <laughs> so I put the ones that I, I thought it was probably the more relevant uh, and more interesting uh, regarding the new developments and, and things of that nature, and maybe some more graphically uh, interesting for you to see. Um, and, but again, this is not by no means a complete uh, you know, um, list of all the potential rare complications that we can see. Um, these are my disclosures. I mean, you need to do this. So we saw this before. I'm not going to go into this again, and the same thing with this. So I'm going to go directly into the rare complications with Waldenstrom's. So the first one I want to talk about is hyperviscosity. Hyperviscosity is uh, a very interesting topic. Um, if we go back to the two cases that Dr. John Waldenstrom described initially in 1944, they both have anemia, coagulopathy, and hyperviscosity. That's exactly how this disease presented in 1944. This is essentially the, the way that this, this Dr. Waldenstrom knew there was a protein in there that was way too heavy. He didn't even know it was IgM. He just called it a hyperglobulin. He didn't even call it microglobulin. He called it hyperglobulin. That was, that was the way he described it. So this is, uh, in, my, in, my, in my mind, a, a very important aspect of the care of patients with Waldenstrom's that we need to understand really well. So hyperviscosity is a condition in which the blood gets too thick uh, because of the presence of this IgM in excess. IgM is a very large molecule, and the more uh, you know, IgM accumulates in the patient's blood, then the blood is more likely to become thicker. Now, we need to be careful because blood thickening has many different meanings in medicine. If you ask a cardiologist, blood thickening is going to cause heart attacks because of the platelets are too sticky to each other. This is not what happens in Waldenstrom's. If you ask another hematologist, benign hematologist, about clots, right? Oh, yeah, the blood thickening is because of the clot, because of the clotting factors are all messed up. Yeah, this is not what happens in Waldenstrom. So there are different ways in which your blood can be thick. This one is viscosity. So what this means is all the chlorine factors in all the cells in your blood are actually swimming in water, right? So if you have seen your blood, or you have, maybe you haven't, but if you put your blood in a tube and then you let it rest for a while, all the solid components of that blood are going to basically sediment, and it's going to leave this fluid, this plasma, this serum. That plasma is the one that becomes thicker, more viscous. So the platelets are unchanged, the red cells are unchanged, the white cells are unchanged, all the proteins are unchanged. The consistency of that fluid is the one that becomes thicker. And that's the difference between hyperviscosity and anything else. And therefore, aspirin doesn't change hyperviscosity. Uh, blood thinners like uh, Plavix or Warfarin or Lovenox or Eliquis or Pradax or all of those, none of them actually affect hyperviscosity because hyperviscosity has nothing to do with any of that. The only thing that affects hyperviscosity is just you drinking water like hell. That's it. That's the only thing. And, and even going all the way to transparent pee, um, you basically change your, hyper, your viscosity level by about 3 to 4%. Right? So, that, but there's, you know, maybe that 3 to 4% keep you out of trouble. But again, that, that is, that is the, you know, so that's the only way to actually dilute yourself. You know, just, by, by making, just for you to understand what different blood thickening means in different worlds. So in any case, uh, hyperviscosity is a syndrome that is characterized by a number of different issues. Clinically speaking, the way it was described initially was uh, presence of uh, nosebleeds. Uh, and that happens because our vessels in our nose are very uh, thin, like everywhere else in our bodies. It's just that those areas are more, much more exposed. And the changes in temperature in our, in our nose tip is actually much higher than everybody everywhere else. So what happens is these little vessels get get basically blocked by, by, by the IgM and the, and the viscosity, and then this promotes you know, kind of a burst of these vessels and the, and the nosebleeds. Headaches can happen too, and that can happen specifically because of the sluggishness of the circulation in the brain, and that can also cause blurred vision because of changes in the retinas uh, in our eyes. That could be anywhere from you know, thickening of the vessels all the way to hemorrhaging in the retinas, and, and that's the way this, this, this uh, appears. Now, um, there is not a linear relationship between IgM and viscosity. You know? 
So your IgM can go from a 1, 0 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000. Even at that level, the viscosity level hasn't really changed much. It's when you hit 3,000 and it starts, then that's when the viscosity starts climbing back up. And then really it, it multiplies itself. So three to 4,000, the risk is smaller. Four to five is higher. Five to six, much higher. Over 6,000 is about 100 times higher than the prior one. So that's, and again, that might or might not apply to you. This is a group of people that we're talking about. We did a study about 800 patients. 150 patients had hyperviscosity, and I'm gonna show you those data in a second. So what we have noticed is, just going back to the CXCR4 question is, in CXCR4 mutated patients, these patients seem, seem to have higher levels of IgM and also more likely to have hyperviscosity. I think it's just as a function of having more IgM. So um, when I went back in the, into the blood bank and I actually inquired about the need of you know, plasmapheresis because we plasmapheresis patients for many diff different reasons, hyperviscosity is actually the most common reason why people get plasmapheresis in the blood bank. You know? So this is something that I wanna show you. This is how a retinal bleed looks like in a patient with Waldenstrom's. Um, not only there's a lot of tortuosity and engorgement of the retinal vessels, as you can see here, and if you cannot see it, you have to trust me. Um, <laughs> but you, the, what you can actually see are there these, these little burst cells, sorry, burst uh, vessels, you know, that, that, is, that is easily identifiable there. So any ophthalmologist knows about this, and you know, whenever you go and see your ophthalmologist, when your IgM is over 3,000 and have your eyes checked, this is what they're looking for. Hopefully they are not gonna find it. So the reason we do plasmapheresis is because uh, we use a filter that is able to remove that IgM being a large molecule is easier to remove, right? Um, and, and this is a study that we did as well in which we did one, we, this is a baseline. After the first, after the second, and after a third plasmapheresis, we see how we can decrease the percentage of, the level of IgM in a reliable manner, almost in a linear manner, per, um, per uh, filtering process. So we typically like to do three when patients are actively massively symptomatic. If we're trying to just do preventative, prophylactic, let's say somebody presented like this, we brought them down all the way down. Sometimes we do it once every four weeks, just once, but that's more of a maintenance type of thing. In the acute setting, we like to give at least two, if not three, plasmapheresis in, in about three, four days to bring the IgM level from about a median of 6,500 to a median of about 2,500. It's not perfect, doesn't remove all the IgM, um, but again, if we don't do anything else after this point, uh, the IgM will come back up again. I mean, your body likes to remain in a steady state situation, so if you do not do anything else, you are just skimming, you know, you're just taking out the product of those cells, but we are not doing anything to the malignant cells. So those, that IgM will basically go back up to its normal level within four weeks after completion of this plasmapheresis. So the same way it removes the IgM and it helps for hyperviscosity, we will see also that if you patients have symptomatic cryoglobulinemias, that can also help. And if you have a symptomatic cold agglutininemia, if it's very acute, that can also help. So removing the IgM can help in many different scenarios, not only hyperviscosity. So this is the study I was telling you about. This is the, uh, a study in which we looked at, um, at the time on, in which the patients had a specific level of IgM, what was the likelihood that the patients were gonna have some degree of symptomatic hyperviscosity at that moment. And again, nothing is perfect in this life and this is just our data and this might not you know, represent what other people's experience might be. This is our experience in our patients. We see here uh, IgMs between zero and 1,000, one to 2,000, two to three, right? Each, each column is three to four and like this. So below 3,000, I don't know what's going on with this, I think the Below 3,000, really, there's no black column, so there's no hyperviscosity issues up to that point. But between, between three and four, we see a little bit, around 5%. Between four and five, it goes to around 20%. Between five and six, we see around three, around you know, 30%. And when we go back to over 6,000, 6, so 6, then we saw about 70% of patients tend to have symptomatic hyperviscosity at that moment, right? That, that's in the moment. But then we also evaluated the prediction of it, and this is what we see. If you have an IgM at presentation when you come to see us in the clinic that is below 3,000, the likelihood that you will have hyperviscosity, this is, this is in months, is, is 
pretty much negligible. Some people might, but it's, it's very, very rare that you will do that, right? Now, if you are about 3,000 and then 4,000, 5,000, the your risk is higher, right? That you will develop hyperviscosity at some point in the future, and sometimes it's years from that. But if your IgM is over 6,000, 50% of those patients within three months are developing symptoms of hyperviscosity. So in, in some patients in whom we're concerned, they're having many, some type of symptom or something like that, and the IgM is over 6,000, we tend to recommend treatment for Waldenstrom's at that moment. That being said, that doesn't mean that everybody with an IgM of 6,000 will have hyperviscosity within three months. That's not what it means, just half of the patients. The other half could go forever with this. We have patients at 6,000, 6,500, 7,000, right, who, in whom they feel well, there's no problems, no problem. They would check on their eyes, you know, like hawks every three months, and nothing is happening. So, and this brings me to the other question. I mean, not all the IgMs are sticky. I mean, there are some IgMs that are stickier than other IgMs. And again, what makes an IgM stickier than other IgMs? I have no idea. You know, and that's part, that's part, of, the, that's part of the research that we, con we should continue doing as well. But this is, this is uh, the issue with hyperviscosity. Now, an additional problem with hyperviscosity, and this is very specific for Waldenstrom's, is the concerns of a flare when you get exposed to rituximab. You know? um, unfortunately, I continue getting patients who come to see me who had high IgMs and their doctors gave them rituximab alone, and then the IgMs had higher after that exposure because they had a flare and they had a, a bad outcome because of the hyperviscosity, and they come to see me, and I'm like, well, you know, what can I tell you, right? So um, this flare was uh, something that Dr. Trion described many years ago in which patients, not everybody, just about 40% of patients who get exposed to rituximab as a single agent, actually the IgM can actually triple in some patients. The range of increase can go from 25% increase to about 300% increase based on our data. So if you have an IgM of 5,000 and you triple that, that is not a good thing to have. You know? The problem is we cannot know. Just by looking at you and your pretty faces, I cannot say who will have that problem. There is no predictive value. We believe that an IgM of over 4,000 probably predicts that somebody will have a flare, but we don't know how big of a flare that's going to happen or not. So we always have to be very careful about that. So what we do is... Um, we start the other treatment first, either benamustin or the Velcade or the carfilzomib or the cyclophosphamide or the ibrutinib first for about a month or two to bring the IgM down. Once we do that, then we add rituximab with more, with more confidence. So when we combine rituximab in that scenario, the risk of flare falls dramatically to about 5 to 10% only compared to 40 to 50%. And in the, in the, in the, the, the size of that flare is actually much smaller too. Usually within 20 to 25% of levels, this doesn't really, really go over 100 to 200% of levels. So that's why we tend to be very careful about hyperviscosity. And this is one of the very important rare complications that I, that, I, that I wanted to touch base very early on. In that same vein, we do have cryoglobulins. Cryoglobulins can actually compound with hyperviscosity. And these are the patients in whom even with lower IgM than expected, unexpected, they actually end up having hyperviscosity. You know, these are the patients who have hyperviscosity with IgM levels of 1,000 or, or, or 1,500. You will not expect somebody with those levels to have hyperviscosity. But if they have cryoglobulins, that can actually make the, the IgM even thicker. So this is a patient of ours that presented, as you can see here, all modeled, the, you know, the hands and the, and the feet and the earlobes. And after the plasmapheresis, you know, the circulation kind of resolves and, and just starts, you know, she, the, the skin and all that looks and reverses very nicely. So interestingly enough, in patients who have cryoglobulins, their IgM levels are more erratic. You know, as you, as you know, there's, hyper, there's, there's variability in IgM. The IgM is not a steady number. And it always backs and forth around 10%, depending on the laboratory. So if your IgM is, let's say, 2,000, your IgM can fluctuate between 1,800 and 2,200. And that will be okay. I would have any problems with it. Now, with cryoglobulins, that range could be even higher, and specifically because cryoglobulins, cryo means cold, so it, it reacts to cold. It basically starts crystallizing under cold uh, temperature. So if I take the blood from you and it's running around 99, 98, 98 degrees, and I put it in the shelf and I wait for about five minutes, 
that temperature of that sample dropped to about 80 or 75. And that's enough sometimes to crystallize some of, some of the IgM. So if we don't reheat that sample and we run the IgM on that sample, that sample is going to show you a low IgM that is not real. So we need to be very mindful of that. So reheating the sample or keeping the sample you know, uh, warm at 38 or body temperature until it's there going to be run in the machine is probably the, the common practice. But that should be done only in the patient with known cryoglobulins. Otherwise, there's no reason. So for that, I, I, plasmapheresis in the management is very important for cryoglobulins as well. And the other one is cold agglutinins. I'm going to challenge you here to tell me which one is the normal, the normal appearance of, of the blood. And you will probably, 99% here will tell me that the right is what is normal. And you can see, you know, nice round cells. This is how a normal blood stream should look like or blood slide should look like. In a patient with cold agglutinins is on the left, we see how these red cells are all clumped because of the IgM, um, you know, and as they clump, it's difficult for those cells to pass through the different vessels that we have, and those red cells get destroyed, you know, and patients do have what we call hemolysis or red cell destruction. So this is something that is also mediated by IgM, and again, why some patients have collagglutinins and why some patients have cryoglobulins and some patients do not have these problems? Is, is some, it's a question that we don't understand really well. I think, be, I believe that there, there are some physical changes of the IgM that is very specific, some physical characteristics of the IgM that everybody here has. And that's why some of you have neuropathy and while others don't, and why some of you have hyperviscosity and others don't. I think it has to do with that, but obviously it's, it's research to be done. Uh, so this is the way we look at this, patient hyperviscosity. If the patient has active hyperviscosity, then we do plasmapheresis. If the patient has mutations of CXCR4, which is a concern for hyperviscosity, you know, then you know, we try with it really with the brutin and things like that. It's actually, this is reverse. This, is, this should be yes, and this should be no. Sorry about that. Um, so bendamastin, if you have a mutation, then bendamastin in, in Velcade and carfilzomib should be better options, maybe just to get a faster response. Well, if you don't have CXF mutations, then I think ibrutinib is a very good option in those patients too. And again, holding rituximab is the right thing to do. The next one is neuropathy. Neuropathy is a very difficult issue to, for most patients and, and doctors out there because I don't think we understand neuropathy with IgM really well. So what I, we have done, uh, not only as uh, me, but as a part of the, uh, a group of people, is come up with six criteria to kind of tell me which neuropathy is actually related to the IgM? Because you know, if you go out there, neuropathy is really common, you know, while Waldenstrom's is not. So can it be possible that a patient with Waldenstrom's can have a neuropathy that is not even related to the Waldenstrom's, right? Can it be diabetic neuropathy? Can it be B12 deficiency, right? Can, be, can it be anything else that is probably not related to this? So we have come up with these six criteria to say which one is the neuropathy that is more likely to be related to IgM and Waldenstrom's so it has to be bilateral and symmetrical. So it has to affect both sides at the same time. It has to affect the feet first, actually the toes first. And we call that length dependence. The longest, the nerve, which are the ones that go to the toes, the first one that get affected. So you know, we have patients, oh, the dorsal, my, my calves hurt. I'm like, okay, so that is probably not the neuropathy because it has to be the toes first, right? So length dependence, that's a very important aspect of things has to be sensory, right? has to be a, a, sen a sensation problem, numbness and tingling much more than burning or pain or change in color, for example. Or when that progresses over years, that's a different story. Uh, progression over years rather than weeks. If somebody tells me, you know, I was fine uh, three months ago and right now I'm very, very, you know, problematic, that's probably not the neuropathy. And maybe it's a neuropathy, yes, but not related to IgM. Then having the anti-MAG antibodies, but this is true in only 50% of patients. And I think this is the one that trumps everything. And sorry for using the word Trump. Um, nerve conduction study, <laughs> nerve conduction studies that show demyelination. Demyelination is the com key component of um, the process of damage by IgM. There are other types of neuropathies, which are the most common, for example, arthritis compressing the nerves. That's a compressive neuropathy that is not demyelinating. For example, diabetes and thyroid problems or B12 deficiency called axonal problems. That is not demyelination. So we need to really have all these factors. Now, if you have, the more factors you have, 
the more likely it is that your IgM is related, is causing the neuropathy, and therefore more likely that if we treat you, you might get better. The fewer the factors here, then the less likely is related. Even if we were to treat you, then we're less likely to make you better. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult game to play, but at least this gives us a, frame, a, a framework in which we can actually you know, kind of standardize our approach to neuropathy. And then the treatment is also not something that we understand really well too. I mean, we have studies like this one that shows that if you give rituximab to patients, then you improve the you know, 10, meter, 10 meter walk time, you improve the neuropathy uh, uh, deficit uh, scores, like the INCAD, which is very complicated, only neurologists understand that. So we do have some studies that show that rituximab actually makes patients better. And then we have other studies that actually show that rituximab does not improve any of those outcomes. So we really, exactly. So we don't know. No, we don't know. So um, in my mind, if a patient has a neuropathy that is very slowly progressing or basically stable, you know, I, I'd rather do not treat those patients, right? Now, if I see some progression and I see that it's affecting the patient's quality of life at some point, then I think that those patients are more likely to be beneficial as long as those six criteria or most of those criteria are actually met. Now, um, rituximab alone you know, is used a lot for this, but I am not completely convinced that that is the right thing to do. And the reason for that is because if rituximab is gonna decrease your IgM uh, in a group of people in only 40 or 50% of those patients, while we have other treatments that can decrease that IgM in about 8, 90 or 80% of those patients, then I tend to favor those approaches, right? And again, you know, understanding that neuropathy is not something that is going to kill a patient. Then there's no mortality associated with neuropathy, but there's a severe morbidity associated with neuropathy, which is a very interesting perspective too. So we tend to use combinations much more than anything else, and obviously avoiding treatments that could potentially give you neuropathy. So Velcade right, should be minimized, Vincristine should be minimized. Now we're also trying to understand you know, how these symptoms are affecting the patient, and everybody's different. So there is a score for that. There's an app for that too. So um, there's called the ranking score. And uh, you can see here, you know, zero is no symptoms, which obviously no patient is here. Uh, and then, you know, more and more symptoms depending on how much they affect uh, your activities of the daily living. All activities can, can be met here with no significant disability, but you do have symptoms. That's where most patients are, are ranking one. Those patients should not be treated. If you are a three, four or five, then probably treatment is beneficial for those patients, but go guess it, go, go figure that most patients fall into the category of two, which is the category in which you are like, well, so what should we do? It's not clear if we should treat somebody with a category of two or not treat somebody with a category of two. So we need to really refine our, our, our um, ways of evaluating patients and understanding how we can benefit them too. So, uh, you know, um, there's some data suggesting combinations are better than rituximab alone, but this is not a prospective study. It's a French study, and go if you want to believe the French. Um, so, <laughs> all right. Um, you cannot trust somebody who's like eating croissants every day. Anyway, um, <laughs> this disclosure: I love croissants. I love croissants. All right, so, so in this study, you know, this is a French study, uh, retrospective, uh, 26 patients got rituximab alone, 19 patients got combination, and, and the features were very similar between these two. And you can see here the ranking score, you know, the higher is more, uh, is more severe. So uh, three to four in most patients, two, three, four in most patients. And how, you know, after exposure to therapy, the ranking decreases, the ranking score decreases in, in most patients with treatment. They do improve a little bit more, however, you know, in patients who, who get the combo compared to the patients who had a alone. So, I mean, it's unclear to this time exactly what is the right thing to do with these patients. So if we believe the IgM is driving this, then the goal should be to bring the IgM to the lowest level possible. It's, a, it's kind of an oversimplistic way of looking at it, um, but that's the way we look at it. So again, Neuropathy can be seen also in patients with MGAS without evidence of Waldenstrom's. We do the, do the bone marrow biopsy, there's no Waldenstrom's in there, there's no myeloma, there's no lymphoma. So those patients actually have an MGAS, but those patients can have a neuropathy. 
And actually, the intensity of the neuropathy doesn't really tell me if somebody has a benign or malignant process. We have patients with Waldenstrom with very mild neuropathies, and we have patients with MGAS with very bad neuropathies. So that benign, malignant doesn't really tell me about the intensity of it. But what it tells me, it limits my options. If I have only MGAS and I don't have a malignant process, then my options are more limited to rituximab, IVIG, even cyclophosphamide, and that's pretty much all I can give. Insurances are not going to pay for anything more in, more like ibrutinib or pendamastin like in these, these treatments. But we're trying to change that. We are having an NCCN, um, uh, a new, um, in which we're going to be kind of developing guidelines to treat patients with neurological and renal problems who have MGAS but not a clear diagnosis of, of malignancy. So that is something that is up and coming and uh, we'll be working on it very shortly. Renal disease is something that we don't see very much in Waldenstrom. In myeloma, we see it all the time. 40 to 50% of patients with myeloma will have a kidney problem because of the myeloma. And this rarity drives the myeloma doctors nuts because they feel that Waldenstrom's having the IgM and the free lichens and all that stuff should also have such bad kidney disease as they do, and, and that is not the case. That is not the case. So as you can see, this is the curve of uh, incidence, and again, you know, probably if you can see here, maybe 5% at 15 years, you know? It, most, most patients with myeloma within five years, 50% of those patients have kidney problems. So that curve is pretty much like this. So it's very different. No, it's very rare too. So we, what we did, we took uh, all our patients uh, with, with kidney problems who actually had a biopsy of the kidney just to make sure that we are talking about things that we can actually prove, not only imagine. And we, interestingly enough, we biopsy about 120 people of which half of those, the kidney problem was not related to the Waldenstrom's. It was hypertension, it was diabetes, it was something different, had nothing to do with the Waldenstrom's. But half of those patients did have problems with the Waldenstrom's, and these are the different subtypes of things that, can, that could be. So as you can see here, it's not just one thing. It could be different things. I'm going to show you the different things that it could be in, in figures. So on the left, we have a case in which the kidney was taken out, and what we saw was Waldenstrom cells. We call it lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma infiltration. So what we saw was the Waldenstrom's. This is CD20, this is IgM, lots of Waldenstrom's in the, in the kidney, involved in the kidney. So that's one way in which it could happen. The other cases where the light chain was actually forming little casts that was blocking the tubules inside the kidneys. It's a completely different way of, uh, of causing, there was no malignant cells, there was just these casts made out of light chains. That is the way that myeloma affects the kidneys, for example. So we call this myeloma kidney. So we see myeloma kidney in Waldenstrom's. While we also see Waldenstrom kidney in Waldenstrom's. Now, we do have, the, the light chains can also deposit in, a, in different ways, not, pro, not forming light chains, but actually depositing themselves into the kidney. That is something that we call MIDD. So it's a completely different way in which this happens. And you can see how it looks completely different in, under the microscope. And finally, we also can have amyloidosis in the kidney, which is a completely different way in which the Waldenstrom's can cause problems, cause amyloidosis, and the amyloidosis affects the kidney. We had patients who actually had the three types of kidneys uh, problems in the same kidney. In the same biopsy, they had Waldenstrom cells and have light chain, which is the myeloma kidney, and had some amyloidosis, so the patient had three different processes in the kidney. But again, those are extremely rare situations, you know? Extremely rare situation. So we need to, when, if we want to go down the road of saying, well, maybe your kidney function is not great, how convinced are we that is the, is the Waldenstrom's? First, we need to rule out everything else. And only if we are not able to rule out everything else, then go down the road of a biopsy. But never treat blindly, because you could be treating somebody for a hypertensive kidney problem, and that is probably not the right thing to do, to give them chemotherapy or ibrutinib, for example. So with the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's and we have renal involvement, we need to confirm the diagnosis, period. If we don't confirm, we shouldn't be treating blindly these patients. And again, if you have amyloidosis, there's a complete separate approach to that. If you have other problems related to the IgM or the Waldenstrom's or the free light chains, we have a different types of approaches for those patients as well. Now, let's talk about Big Neal syndrome. Big Neal syndrome is a condition in which the Waldenstrom cells get access into the brain and the spine of the patients with Waldenstrom's. Now, 
the initial report of Bing Neal syndrome, Dr. Bing and Dr. Von Neal. It was in 1936. They reported Bing Neal syndrome eight years before they reported Waldenstrom for the first time, which is an interesting finding. And again, they also saw changes in the, in the patient's mentation in patients with hyperglobulinemia. That's how they, they actually reported it, not, not macro, hyper. I'm going to change that. Hyper, I like it. Anyway, so in these situations, uh, these Waldenstrom cells can actually affect the, the, the brain or the spine. And really, in our data, about 1% of patients have this problem, just 1%. Uh, more recently, maybe 1.5%, but, but still in the, in the very low rate. We can see how this is a, a patient of mine that I, that I saw uh, years ago in which you know, we see their um, malignant Waldenstrom cells in the spinal fluid. This is how it looks like. And we can see how the different ways in which the disease manifests. I mean, there's a list of things that can affect how patients can be affected. We can see weakness uh, of the limbs. We can see change in mental status. We can see uh, paralysis on different areas of the face, uh, neuropathy, but not the classic neuropathy that I just talked to you about. It's a very atypical neuropathy. Headaches, I wanna, I wanna warn you about headaches. Uh, headaches alone is not a, a suspicion for, for Big Neal syndrome. It has to be really bad headaches. It has to be usually in combination with other agents, not headaches alone in most cases. Uh, seizures, I mean, that's a, a big one. Uh, and again, you know, gait problems as well, and pain in the limbs too. So the, the issue with Bing Neal syndrome is that most of the agents that we have talked about do not penetrate into the brain. So treatments like Velcade, Rituximab, Carfilzomib, Cyclophosphamide, those do not penetrate into the, into the brain. So they, from all the treatment options that we have for Waldenstrom's, the treatment options for Bing Neal are actually much more reduced to the medications that actually can penetrate into the, into the spinal fluid. And that's what makes things a bit more complicated for our big Neal patients. So the classic agents that cross into the blood-brain barrier are actually chemotherapy agents. Fludarabine, which damages the stem cells. High-dose methotrexate, that basically can affect every organ in your body when you get a high dose of it. If you need it for very aggressive lymphomas in your brain, we use it all the time but it's a toxic regimen. You need to be in the hospital for about uh, four or five days. Your body needs to clear that methotrexate, otherwise it can give you some uh, severe toxicities. High-dose itarabine, we use high-dose itarabine to treat leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, for example, again, in the hospital, many days of admission. So these are effective treatments, but they are very toxic. You know? So we need to be very mindful on you know, what we give to those patients with Bing Neal syndrome. So we actually um, did a study in which uh, we kind of felt that ibrutinib has, at least in rats, shown that it can penetrate into the brain tissue. So uh, there was one patient that was treated with Bing Neal syndrome that was treated with ibrutinib, and what we did was actually measure spinal fluid levels of ibrutinib and see how uh, much you know, levels of ibrutinib do get into the brain tissue. And this is a study that was run by, between Dr. Trion and, 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 the, and the manufacturers of, of ibrutinib. You can see the patient, how it had a, a, a mass in the brain that basically resolved with the treatment of ibrutinib. And we can see how it, you know, the, the spinal fluid does have some level of ibrutinib that is measured anywhere between you know, 2 and 4% of the, of the levels of the blood. And you say you know, 2 to 4%, that's not a lot. But when you look at the actual level in concentration, it's enough to actually block BTK in the spinal fluid in a successful manner, right? So that's, that's actually give us an idea that we can potentially treat UC brutinib also for patients with Bing Neal syndrome. And we did this study in which 28 patients, I think about uh, half of those patients were our patients from Dana-Farber on ibrutinib. And there's a combination of people here from the Mayo Clinic, Sloan Kettering, uh, some places in Australia, some places in, in Europe as well, in which they give us their data and we basically published this earlier this year. And we can see here what we did, I, I classified this, the, the, the improvement of patients in three groups, symptom improvements, MRI improvements, and spinal fluid improvements. So there are different aspects that we need to look at patients with big needles. It's a little bit more complicated than just measuring the IgM or the hemoglobin. We need to measure other markers to see if that is actually doing something for those patients. So within three months, 80% of patients have actually an improvement on their symptoms. 
and about 60% of patients had an improvement on their MRIs, and about 50% of patients had clearance of their spinal fluid from malignant cells. Within six months, a very similar picture, so this sustained, sustained up to the 12-month mark, and we continue at the, you know, gathering this data. I'm gonna be publishing, hopefully within a year, an update on this with more follow-up, but it seems to us that patients with Big Neal syndrome do benefit from ibrutinib. Now there's data that zanubrutinib, this new, this, uh, new BTK, also crosses the blood-brain barrier. So that's another option for patients with Big Neal syndrome. And as I mentioned earlier, there's one protosome inhibitor called marisomib that actually can cross into the, into, into the blood-brain barrier too. So I think there are gonna be more options moving down the line for patients with Big Neal syndrome. Just a week ago, a first treatment of a patient with CLL with brain involvement responded to venetoclax. And they measure venetoclax levels in the spinal fluid and it also penetrates into the spinal fluid. So all of a sudden, we're seeing you know, a boom of the different options and different treatments that are not chemotherapy that could potentially be beneficial for patients with being ill syndrome. So obviously, no, it's not a good thing to have, but I think it's a good time in which we're seeing many more options uh, opening up for those patients too. Now the problem comes that most of these patients are actually excluded from clinical trials. Specifically in the design of clinical trials for any type of lymphoma, we remove the patients or we do not include the patients who are, uh, have uh, involvement of the brain and the, and the spinal fluid. That's, uh, that's something that we've been doing classically for this. So we either have to change that or start doing studies specifically for patients with venial syndrome. And because of the rarity of it, that's gonna be easier said than done. But it has to be multi-institutional, has to be multi-center, has to be multinational, otherwise it's not going to work. So if a patient has diagnosis of Big Neal syndrome, there is a group of people who are actually asymptomatic from the Big Neal, so those patients are watching, like, very much like Waldenstrom's. But if they are, do, are symptomatic, then ibrutinib, I think, uh, could become the, the first line of treatment before we expose patients to uh, more toxic agents. But we, what we have seen as well is that even though the patients feel better and the MRIs are better, sometimes patients do have some malignant cells in the spinal fluid that are still swimming in there, but really not doing much, very much like with Waldenstrom's, right? We don't cure Waldenstrom's. We have some Waldenstrom's somewhere in our bloodstream. So I think that's probably what we're seeing, and um, we don't know really what the significance of persistence of uh, these cells in the spinal fluid mean at this time. Uh, they don't seem to play a, too much of a role at this moment. Uh, the next uh, rare complication I want to talk about is transformation from Waldenstrom's to a more aggressive lymphoma called, called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is transformation. Um, this is a phenomenon that happens in all the low-grade lymphomas and low-grade lymphoproliferative disorders. Follicular lymphoma transforms at a much higher rate. Marginal some lymphoma transforms. Um, CLL transforms into diffuse large B cell. So this is something that happens and obviously has happened in patients with Waldenstrom's as well. So we published this data uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, 1,500 people are our database at that moment, of which about 20% transform, 20 transform, which is about 1.5% uh, total. But when we look at the, at the, at the incidence uh, cumulative, it basically runs at about 1% every five years. So it's a very low risk, but it can happen. So we need to be uh, very careful about this. So whenever we see a patient who was doing okay in the middle of treatment or responding to treatment, or even before they get to be treated, and all of a sudden they get sicker, having, feeling really bad, or one area, one lymph node getting really big, uh, having patients really bad fevers and night sweats, much more than what they had previously, those are, situations in which we start getting worried about transformation to a more aggressive lymphoma. Sometimes the calcium goes up for no reason. Sometimes the IgM just starts doubling for no reason. I mean, when we see those atypical ways, we say, well, no, this is not how Waldenstrom's behaves, then we need to start thinking about a potential aggressive transformation in that specific scenario. And obviously, the, you know, the, the right way to to deal with this is dealing with this as it is, with as patients had an aggressive lymphoma. So we do PET-CTs on those patients, and we need to biopsy. 
right? In the moment that we, we are concerned about something of this nature, we need to go in, try to get a piece of this leaf node or this mass that seems to be getting bigger, and then to try to understand exactly what that works uh, and how it is. So if the patients have never been treated, then we treat them as aggressive lymphomas. Interestingly enough, aggressive lymphomas can be cured compared to Waldenstrom's, and it cannot be cured. So we give these patients treatments with treatments that we give to patients with aggressive lymphomas. And, and, and about 90% of those patients you know, will respond, and about you know, uh, two-thirds of those patients will be cured probably from the, from the aggressive lymphoma, but will not be able to cure the Waldenstrom's, which is the interesting component of this thing. So if somebody was previously treated but never got you know, chemo, we actually give them chemotherapy. If the patients got chemo previously, and then obviously we need to treat with other, with other types of treatments, but um, we can cure this. I mean, and this, this, is the, this is the interesting part. It's a, it's a scary thought, right, to, to develop, to, have a, to be at a risk of developing a more aggressive lymphoma. But interestingly enough, those can actually be cured compared to the wild ones they cannot. So this is the, a funny conversation that I have with my patients. And when I give this high dose of chemotherapy, we want to get rid of your, of your aggressive lymphoma. And everybody's like, so what's going to happen with my Waldenstrom's? Oh, you're just going to stay. <laughs> that's that's, that's going to stay right there. It's going to get better, right? It's going to get better with the chemos, as we, um, many of you probably have got our chop as well in the past. So yeah, it's going to get better. It's going to respond. You're going to get your progression-free survival, and you're going to be fine with that. But, but we're not going to get rid of it, you know? So um, just to, you know, I, I think this is probably the end of, of, of the presentation. So just to remind you that, you know, this is probably one of the reasons um, why I am doing what I'm doing, what I'm doing, you know? When I joined the Nafarra, and some of you know this story, they told me, you have three months to decide if you want to stay doing Waldenstrom's or not. And within three weeks, I knew that I wanted to stay. And, and this is one of the reasons, the, the variety of this. It's not, it's, you're not seeing the one thing all the time, right? Everybody was like, you want to be seeing Waldenstrom's? It's like, that's it. And I'm like, well, there's not it, right? You have the neuropathies, and you have the transformations, and you have the amyloidosis, and you have this, and you have the hyperviscosities, and it, it is different diseases in my mind, clinically speaking, some of them are different diseases. And now we're we starting to understand how each of these diseases might be different genomically speaking too, right? With the advent of the new genomic mutations and the difference on these mutations and what they mean. So I think it's such a, an amazing field to be work on. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity that you give me of, of doing something that makes me happy. And for that, I thank you. For symptomatic Waldenstrom's patients who have chronic kidney disease not caused by diabetes or hypertension, is there any evidence that treating Waldenstrom's and maybe getting IgM into the normal range will slow or halt the progression of CKD? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we believe, I, I think in short, the answer is yes. but. Um, there are conditions that are easier to be reversed than other conditions. Uh, in that study that I, that I was putting the, the figures, the, the, the pictures on, if you had, for example, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma infiltration, those tend to respond better to treatments compared to amyloidosis, for example. I'm just putting you the, the two extremes, right? So the best ones, <laughs> sorry about that, but <laughs> in the best scenario, it would be, you know, lymphoplasmacytic infiltration, because that's easy to get rid of with venomustine, for example, or rituximab, and then the, the kidneys tend to recover in most patients. But if you have amyloidosis, then that's a bit more complicated. Yeah? So yeah, and everything else falls kind of in between, you know, depending on where you are. So uh, the biopsy can tell you a lot, because if, if the biopsy is already showing a lot of fibrosis and, and scarring, then you can get a sense that maybe there's not going to be a lot of uh, recovery. But if there's not a lot of scarring, you know, and it seems everything looks a bit more acute, more, more inflammatory, then maybe that's an indication that things might turn back a little, a little quicker. So it's, 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 there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of leeway in that. I just had a quick question. Um, if I'm understanding right, your IgM being high means that you probably have the hyperviscosity? Is that right? Not necessarily. So hyperviscosity is a clinical syndrome. 
in patients need to be symptomatic from that. Okay. Well, I had an IgM over 7,000, and the doctor wanted to start rituxan immediately. Yes. But he said he checked the viscosity, and he said, oh, your viscosity is not that high. So he went ahead and did it. But okay. it's still going to spike, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's dangerous? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, every, everybody practices in a different manner, right? Uh, in, in your situation... Yeah, he's not a specialist, obviously. No, no, I understand that. And again, everybody practices in a different way. So what I, I, would, have, I would have not done that. You right, know, I would have right. ferries you and give you the, uh, not some other treatment. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is that you might or might not have an IgM flare. And even if you, you have an IgM of 7,000, you might or might not have hyperviscosity at that moment. Right? So, I mean, what we're showing here is data that we see in a group of people. Okay. What applies to the individual patient could be anywhere in that graph. And, and that's, so they and that's need to the check the viscosity. Exactly. Not so what I, I would have been much more careful because even if I do the viscosity, I mean, uh, my concern is more clinical based on the data that, I, that we know about. Right. And, and I would have been a bit more careful about that. So what right. happens with a the spike then? Yeah. Uh, if it, so if the thing is I, I don't typically give rituximab alone in this scenario, but if I were to do that, I would have measured your IgM on a weekly basis for at least uh, four weeks to make sure that you are not actually spiking so I can freeze you as, as, as quickly as possible. You know, I was not, I, I, I would have not done that. No, but next if time I, I go to a that. specialist. Yeah, exactly, okay. so, so that's, all right. Hi, another uh -huh. hyperviscosity question. Yes. Um, is there any other factor besides IgM that affects serum viscosity? Because um, um, my serum viscosity number is the same when I had IgM 4100 and 1800. Yeah, uh, and again, that, is, that it varies greatly, and we need to understand that serum viscosity is not a perfect test either, right? So the, the same as IgM, it, it, there's some imperfections on that test. So uh, there are people who clearly have hyperviscosity symptoms, and their viscosity levels are not dramatically elevated. While patients we do have with hyperviscosity symptoms with normal, with normal viscosity levels. So uh, I, I, everything has to be taken in the right context. So I typically do not make a diagnosis of viscosity uh, based on just one number. I looked at the IgM, I look at the viscosity, I look at the symptoms, I look at the eyes. And so I, mean, I look at a number of different factors and then I make a decision if the patient is having active hyperviscosity or not or if the patient is not, if the patient is at a higher risk of hyperviscosity or not. So I kind of, kind of evaluate those patients in that, in that setting. I don't use just one value to either be too concerned or be less concerned about something. Thank you. Hello, doctor. Um, you talked about a percentage change in IgM being somewhat normal. Um, so in his, my husband's situation, he's been a patient for 13 years, diagnosed 13 years, 10 years since treatment. And he was carrying an IgM of 2,000 and change. And then just about six months ago, it dropped to 1,100. And then four months later, it came back to 1,500. Is that indicative of a change in the disease? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I never really make, uh, as you can understand, if you're my patient, you know this, uh, I never really make any, too much out of the difference between two points, okay. two data points. Um, mm -hmm. because he's trying to figure out what a movie is all about with just two pictures, which mm -hmm. okay. you know, if you watch Inception ever, you will never figure that out. That's true. So, <laughs> so, um, so, that, that, so the point is, the more data we collect, the better. So as long as the IgM or any value is at a dangerous level and the patient is not actively symptomatic and concerning to do something immediately, mm -hmm. you know, I always recommend continued follow-up. And continue checking the IgMs every three months, and then we'll see where that goes, right? Okay. And we have seen, yeah, we have seen ups and downs. Now, the ups and downs are more prominent when you use different laboratories even. Because within the same laboratory, you are using the same reagents, and you have a, a, a smaller range of variability, but you are using different labs. They're all having different reagents. And actually, that can increase the variability even higher to about 20 or 25 percent plus or minus. And then sometimes, and that happened recently at Dana Farber, they change the reagent in the laboratory. They don't even tell you, right? Okay. They, 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 don't, they don't, you go to the laboratory, they don't know how to tell you, you know what, we changed the IgM reagent. They don't tell you that. So, so that, that happens too. So there, there's so many aspects of things okay. behind it that is, you know, we just need to be careful. All right, thank you. Sure. 
All right, thank you, everybody. I'll see you a little bit later. I'll be around. <laughs>